Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to see all of you. Would have preferred not to see boxes, but that's what we have to deal with these days. So we're opening the new year for our lecture series at the Alvesian Family Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Parkinson's Disease. I think most of you are familiar with this really wonderful center that we put together at Tel Aviv University about a year and a half ago, co-directed the center with me is Professor Nir Giladi, and you'll hear from him in a minute. I want to remind you that we will be having this lecture series on the last Thursday of every month. We have changed the time, so it will be at two o'clock in the afternoon. Again, the last Thursday of every month at two o'clock in the afternoon. And on November 26, we will have uh, another uh, series um, and hope that you can join us. And a month later, we're going to hear from the grant award winners. So without further ado, again, I wanna welcome you and I'm looking forward to an exciting year to learn, research and study Parkinson's disease, and try to achieve all of our dreams and trying to combat this really difficult disease. Nir, I'll turn over the gavel to you. Thanks, Karen, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, my uh, great honor to introduce a good and old friend of mine, uh, Ron Postuma, who is a uh, a professor at uh, McGill University in uh, uh, Canada uh, in the Department of Neurology. Ron has been uh, devoting his career to uh, early markers of non-motor features of Parkinson's disease. Uh, he's really uh, established the whole field of uh, uh, detecting early uh, uh, signs of uh, future development of Parkinson. We have a lot of uh, common interest in uh, sleep. Uh, he uh, uh, really focused his uh, research over the past uh, several years, I think almost a decade run, on uh, REM sleep behavioral disorders, and actually uh, showed the world that this is the early, probably the earliest sign of uh, Parkinson. Uh, he's also co-directing a task force of the Movement Disorder Society on uh, uh, defining Parkinson's disease and also establishing the uh, likelihood ratio to develop Parkinson in, in the future. I think these are all uh, very seminal uh, uh, jobs and, and work that he's been involved in. And it's a great honor to have you with us and uh, share your perspective on uh, the prodromal Parkinson and sleep uh, especially. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks, thanks Nadir, for uh, Nir, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming. I was supposed to actually come uh, in person. Uh, I was scheduled to come in in, uh, in April, I think it was. And obviously, that never happened uh, for reasons that we're all aware of. Um, anyway, I hope some point we can see each other in person uh, at some future date when this is all over. I'm sure it will end at uh, some time. Um, so uh, as Nir mentioned, I, I work a lot on uh, sleep uh, disorders, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder in particular, and that's what we're going to focus on in general. But I'm going to start by uh, speaking uh, more generally. So we'll talk about Parkinson's and the idea of predicting Parkinson's disease or identifying early stages of Parkinson's disease, if you will. Um, and then we'll focus on REM sleep behavior disorder. And uh, I'll do a little bit of a sideline on REM sleep behavior disorder as a prognostic marker in Parkinson's because there's a lot of new research on that. But then we'll really uh, talk about REM sleep behavior disorder and what one can do with it uh, to uh, identify early uh, Parkinson's disease. So if I was giving a talk in, say, the 1970s, this is something like the slide that you would show. You would show these two brains side by side, and the one on the right, uh, which I'm going to make with a nicer laser pointer, is the normal control here with the normal substantia nigra. And the one on the left is the Parkinson patients who has their a loss of their substantia nigra. Parkinson's disease is the dopaminergic disease of the substantia nigra. Uh, that's what Parkinson's is. It's become very, very clear um, based on two major uh, advances. First of all, uh, the recognition of synuclein, which allowed us to identify uh, areas of the brain that were degenerated outside the substantia nigra. And secondly, the successful treatments of uh, Parkinson's disease motor features, which allowed us to see that there are a lot of other features of Parkinson's disease, which in fact 
now I think dominate the clinical presentation ultimately at the end and dominate it probably in the uh, prodromal stages as well. So that there are the non-dopaminergic motor problems, the non-dopamine responsive, if you will, uh, things like drooling and choking and falls and freezing, which don't really always respond to dopamine. And then every one of these things in the list, depression, visual changes, constipation, urinary dysfunction, orthostatic hypotension is not on the slide, erectile dysfunction, insomnia, RBD, somnolence, hallucinations, paranoia, and dementia, all of those are very common. Uh, not one of those is seen in less than one third of Parkinson patients at some course in their illness. And I think we didn't notice it because you know, before we had levodopa, we weren't recognizing these symptoms because the motor symptoms were so dominant. And now that we've become successful at treating Parkinson's disease, motor uh, dopaminergic state, we can almost do it perfectly now. Um, we really see that these are all there. And they are what disables our patients in the end. The central point that came out of identification of synuclein and the ability to find synuclein is that the everything else that I just showed you of Parkinson's disease is in fact, in most cases, the earliest stages of Parkinson's disease. Those of you, uh, most of you, I think are very familiar with this initial paper here. This is Heiko Brack's initial staging classification. Just briefly, uh, for those of you who don't, uh, the idea that Parkinson's disease starts in the anterior olfactory nucleus, so here's the olfactory bulb shown here, and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and then does a semi-geographical march, really marching up uh, interconnected um, axons into the lower brainstem, and only finally at stage three, uh, causing uh, the substantia nigra to degenerate. And because of so much redundancy in our dopaminergic system, we don't actually show up in the doctor's office until we're stage four, five, and six, at which point we start to see a synuclein in the cortex. Um, subsequent studies have shown that quite clearly that in probably stage one, the peripheral autonomic system is also involved. And so this may be a peripheral disease at its earliest stages, maybe not its first, but it's certainly its earliest. Now, this is the first one, but it should be mentioned that there have been subsequent revisions or, if you will, uh, restatements of, of staging systems. And so it's not the final word. For example, this is one that the Mayo Clinic has uh, proposed, uh, the idea that Parkinson's disease obligatorily starts in the olfactory area and then either can go down, if you will, into the brainstem, okay, and then loop up into the substantia nigra and eventually the cortex, and that would explain most Parkinson's disease, or it could go around into the limbic system uh, first, get the amygdala, get the cortex, et cetera, then go into these, um, into these uh, substantia nigra, and that would explain the dementia with Lewy bodies that start before you get Parkinson's disease. And so, it's not the only word, the BRAC system. Uh, there are other systems that are out there. And in fact, they might be slightly better at, uh, at uh, capturing the whole scope of uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. All right, I, as Nir mentioned, I was on the uh, task force of the definition of Parkinson's disease. And what we had did is we defined three stages in terms of early stages of Parkinson's disease. So at the first would be clinical Parkinson's disease at the end. Uh, and then clinical Parkinson's disease really still refers to what we would in a doctor's office recognize as Parkinson's disease as motor Parkinsonism, bradykinesia with at least one of rigidity or rest tremor, postural instability is not required anymore uh, for early diagnosis. Uh, and uh, that's clinical Parkinson's disease. The earlier stages can be defined into, if you will, three. There would be a way out here would be a risk stage. So for example, genetic mut mutations, no Parkinson's at all, no pathology at all. So that's not really a stage of disease. But then once the disease itself starts, you get into a preclinical stage where there is some very subtle, usually early neurodegeneration that really has not progressed far enough yet to have clinical symptoms or signs. As soon as you have a recognizable either symptom or sign, we call this now prodromal Parkinson's disease. And so this implies the period of time during which some sign is evident, but the threshold of clinical Parkinsonism has not been reached. And it looks like in most cases, this prodromal state averages around 10 to 15 years in duration. So it's really quite long. 
Why is this so important? Well, we're really trying, and this is the center is a center on prevention of Parkinson's disease. We're really trying to come up with ways to slow the progression of disease. We have excellent treatments now, but the inevitability of wheelchairs and, and, and dementia and the like is, is still there for most of our patients. If we had a neuroprotective therapy, we could not assume that it's gonna stop the disease in its tracks. It's pretty hard to stop an aging related disease completely in its tracks. What it's probably gonna do is slow down the disease. And so if we apply that, say, in the stages of clinical Parkinson's disease, that would be very useful. Uh, we would delay the progression to wheelchairs or institutionalization, et cetera. But if we could apply that same therapy very, very early in the disease, we could even prevent the clinical disease from ever becoming manifest. And so this has led to a very large and massive uh, effort to try and define uh, markers of Parkinson's disease. And so this is just a partial list, and I'm going to cover some of these here in the talk as part of this overview, the list of the markers that are known to predict Parkinson's disease. So what I'm not mentioning is urinary dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, sleepiness, color vision, uh, some of the whole brain glucose utilization, PET and SPECT scans, MIBG scintigraphy, et cetera. But I want to cover a little bit the field to give you a sense of where the entire field of uh, prodromal uh, Parkinson's is. And to do that, I'm gonna put a framework. And the framework is really a practical framework, which is focused around what are we gonna do with these markers once we have them? So really it's moderately useful, I guess, to make a diagnosis of prodromal Parkinson's now. I think it helps a little bit in prognosis, et cetera. But on the other hand, it can be associated with some harms. And I don't think it's an essential thing to make a diagnosis of prodromal Parkinson's disease because we can't do anything about it. But as soon as we have any sort of neuroprotective or preventative uh, or disease modifying treatment, everything is gonna change instantly because what we're gonna to have to do is go into the general population, find people like you and me who have prodromal Parkinson's disease, don't know they have it yet and apply the therapy preventing their uh, progression. So this is a brave new world kind of really big project. And so in order to do that, we're gonna to have to know a few things about each of the markers that we're gonna to use to predict the disease. First of all, we need to know how good is the evidence that the marker works. We don't wanna use a marker that may or may not work. Another probably most critical feature is how strong of a marker is it? In other words, what's its positive predictive value? If something increases your risk by say 50%, uh, like a family history, for example, that's not enough that you're ever gonna take a neuroprotective therapy. But if something almost guarantees you have prodromal Parkinson's disease, that can be sufficient in and of itself to tell you that you should start the therapy. The other thing is it's lead time. So there's no real point in diagnosing prodromal Parkinson's disease three months before you would have showed up in the doctor's office anyway. You really haven't gained very much time at all. What you wanna try and get are markers that can identify the disease in its early enough stages so that intervention in those early stages is meaningful. And then if you imagine this sort of very complicated project of trying to detect prodromal Parkinson's disease, it's obviously going to become essential to know how easy or difficult is it to find these, to use these markers. And in general, the cost is low for clinical markers, things like questionnaires or olfactory tests, but goes up for things like MRI scans or DAT scans and the like, which can be thousands of dollars per person. So clearly this is suggesting that we may end up with a two-stage type of strategy when we try to identify these patients. So with that framework in mind, let's look at some of the key markers of prodromal Parkinson's disease. This is one of the first that was developed and probably the best. There are now actually 10 prospective studies documenting that olfactory loss is a predictor of Parkinson's disease. And it's really quite striking how consistent the relative risks are. It's generally about a four to five fold increase. So if you have olfactory loss, you're at a five fold increase of developing Parkinson's disease in the future, which is really higher than almost every clinical marker except for RBD, which means its positive resistance value is better than most of the clinical markers. There is, if you will, a non-specificity, but maybe not a non-specificity in that olfactory loss also uh, clearly predicts dementia, and it does dementia with Lewy bodies exceptionally well, and does Alzheimer's disease to a lesser extent. There is some differences in uh, Lewy body diseases and Alzheimer's disease in terms of the type of, uh, of olfactory loss that they get. 
The lead time is very contradictory results. I think we're starting to get answers on that. I'll shelve you that and I'll show it to you later. And the testing, what's really notable about olfactory things is it's very easy to test. If you can see my pointer, there is the uh, scratch and sniff, the University of Pennsylvania uh, smell identification test, which you can obviously see can be sent in the, in the mail. That costs about, I guess, $15, something like that, for the short version. This is sniffing sticks, which costs $500, but you can do it over and over and over again. So it's very suitable for large population uh, screening studies. Here's another one, which is also very well established, but raises interesting questions about lead time. So there are now at least six prospective studies documenting that people who have constipation have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. The relative risk is not like olfaction. It's about two, two and a half, as high as three. So that means that the, most people who have constipation, of course, are never going to develop Parkinson's disease. But what's unique about constipation is its lead time. So there are studies that are asking people about their bowel movement habits, bowel movement habits in their 20s and 30s finding that they're increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease in their 50s and 60s. And this starts to beg the question, hold on a minute, how long do we think prodromal Parkinson's really is? So you would assume, I guess, that the constipation is caused by degeneration of the autonomic system that controls the bowel, right? Uh, but does that really happen 30 years before the disease? Or is it maybe that constipation is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease? And those of you who are familiar with, for example, studies on the microbiome could imagine that this might be a way in which uh, pro-inflammatory bad bacteria could sit there more if you're constipated, for example. And those of you aware on the studies suggesting that uh, synuclein can get into the brain via the gut could uh, clearly imagine how having synuclein sit there a lot longer and might increase your risk. So we really don't know uh, what this means. Another illustration of this is anxiety and depression. So again, there is well over, uh, there's probably 10 now, medical record review studies documenting that those who are anxious and those who are depressed have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. But the lead time, the, the lead time studies are very contradictory. Overall, the relative risk, risk, relative risk looks relatively low. I always do that, relative risk looks relatively low. Um, many studies are only finding that depression predicts Parkinson's disease in the next couple of years. In other words, if you get depressed, you get Parkinson's two years later, but if you get depressed and four years later, you still don't have Parkinson's, you don't have an increased risk of Parkinson's anymore. But on the other hand, there are pretty interesting studies showing that people who have a lifelong tendency towards an anxious personality, so phobic tendencies or, or general high maintenance anxiety sort of personalities have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease and so the, one of the interesting studies that sort of def unifies this is a, one of these marvelous Scandinavian massive population-based medical record review studies, which suggested that those who have anxiety and depression have a fourfold increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease over the next two years, but even over the next 25 years have a much lower risk of developing uh, Parkinson's disease, suggesting that depression and anxiety are two things. They are a risk marker, in other words, something like the Parkinson personality that many of you are aware of, and then that's a slight risk factor, and then as neurodegeneration of your serotonergic system, for example, starts to happen, it also becomes a prodromal marker, in other words, a diagnostic sign of, of underlying neurodegenerative disease. Obviously, those who lose their motor system in a subtle way, get subtle Parkinsonian signs, should be at increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. But however, the evidence of this has been strikingly limited until recently. This is a study done in, in Holland, the Rotterdam uh, uh, population-based study, which is really one of the best population-based studies that is out there. And what they do is they have a nurse examining patients or participants at this stage, looking at simple things of motor speed. And what they find is a clear predictive value that when the nurse sees some motor slowing, there is a likelihood ratio, if you like, sort of like a odds ratio or relative risk of about double uh, developing Parkinson's disease. Now, there have been other studies showing that a physician examination suggests that the subtle Parkinsonism has a much higher relative risk, as much as eight or 10. Uh, but this is sort of a nurse quantitative exam, so it's a little less specific. But what's really interesting about this, and I'm going to come back to this, so I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time looking at this in a second, uh, is, is 
What we can see is here's Parkinson's disease diagnosis. So these in red are Parkinson's patients at the time of their diagnosis. And this is their motor score. And these are controls in blue. And what this is, the first study uh, to do this in the general population is that they examine the patients every year. So you can start tracing backwards in time. And you can see when do the, the Parkinson's patients start to deviate from the controls. And it looks like they start deviating about five years before they get the disease. And so this is the first population-based study showing the time course of the development of motor complications of Parkinson's disease it starts about starts in quotation marks about five years before you're diagnosed with disease. And this is something really mind blowing. Okay, so independent activities, daily living look a little bit longer, maybe six or seven years. But if you ask people, have you gone on vacation? You can see that the, the relative likelihood that they traveled for a vacation starts to deviate from normal about five years before they get the disease. And so this has all kinds of interesting, what's going on? Are they more anxious? They don't wanna go, are they apathetic? Or are they just feeling tired? So it indicates that there are life effects of Parkinson's disease uh, that are happening five years before you develop the disease. I'll cycle back to some of this when we look at REMSI behavior disorder. So many of you are familiar with those. There are some brand new markers that you may not be familiar with. This is a, a really interesting one, pure autonomic failure, which is always thought to be a sign of multiple system atrophy. Turns out it's more commonly a sign of, uh, of a synucleinopathy in general. And so this is lab-based primary autonomic failure. In other words, this is autonomic laboratories defining that they have orthostatic hypertension. There is no alternate cause like diabetic neuropathy or antihypertensives. And it's neurogenic that they don't get this phase four of Valsalva overshoot that is seen in neurogenic uh, 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 orthostatic hypertension. And what they did is they did something similar to what I'm gonna show you with REMC behavior disorder, where they identify 74 patients at baseline and they follow them up. It's only a four year follow up. So this is a relatively uh, early study, but what they found quite strikingly is 25 of those 74 patients. In other words, about 34% of those patients developed a neurodegenerative disease. That's 10 to 15% per year. And they only get one disease. If you like to lump the diseases together, it's one disease. They get dementia with Lewy bodies, don't forget that everything we're talking about here generally will predict dementia with Lewy bodies equally than Parkinson's disease because, of course, they're overlapping non-exclusive conditions, if you will. And they get Parkinson's disease and they get multiple system atrophy. In other words, they only get neurodegenerative synucleinopathies, nothing other than that. Cognition is a funny one, okay, because there's growing evidence that cognition clearly can predate Parkinson's disease. And it's a complicated issue because if you were uh, of the uh, opinion that dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease were mutually exclusive conditions, of course, then these are competing risks. And it's very hard to measure the, the uh, predictive value of cognition. Uh, when you have to, by definition, have normal cognition in order to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But if you, the Movement Disorder Society and its definition of Parkinson's disease has disentangled them. So just like we don't say, you know, REM sleep behavior disorder, if it happens before Parkinson's disease, rules out a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease are no longer considered mutually exclusive conditions. In other words, DLD can anticipate Parkinson's disease and I think vice versa. So that makes it very hard to study cognition until you start to take that definition into account. But the Rotterdam study did look at this as well. And so now what they're doing is they're excluding people who have what would be classically, according to the one year rule, dementia with Lewy bodies. And they're just taking Parkinson's patients with normal cognition, uh, normal meaning not demented. And what they find is that test of global cognition uh, particular, and if you look specifically, executive and uh, verbal fluency tests are abnormal in patients destined to develop Parkinson's disease, even when you exclude those who have dementia at onset. So cognitive changes are occurring in the early stages, in the prodromal stages of Parkinson's disease. 
Finally, we have all the usual biomarkers and clinical neuroimaging markers, which really were very far behind the clinical markers, at least a decade behind in general. But these may have a lot of promise for the future. The first one that was described was Substantia Niagara uh, ultrasound, which is uh, you hold an ultrasound probe up to your head, you look at the deposition of iron, and you find that those who have abnormal iron deposition, such as that I'm waving at here, have about a 20-fold increased risk in the original uh, studies, a little bit less in the, in the subsequent studies, risk of developing Parkinson's disease. DAT scan, of course, it, because it's measuring a marker that sort of is like Parkinsonism, it progresses gradually, clearly can predict Parkinson's disease with very good relative risks, sort of in the age of 15, on the order of 15. And MRI, there are very interesting markers of iron deposition, neuromelanin scans, resting state, basal ganglia networks. It's a big field. I don't have time to go into it, but stay tuned. There's a lot going on in neuroimaging and predicting Parkinson's disease. The final thing I want to mention, and this is hot new stuff too, is, is the idea that we're going to make a, a tissue diagnosis early in life. And think about what a major uh, advance this would be if we could make a tissue diagnosis of Parkinson's disease during life. It wouldn't be such a big deal now because we treat Parkinson's disease with dopamine and we can start them on the dopamine and see what happens, right? But if imagine we had a synuclein-based neuroprotective therapy that costs $10,000 a year and only works if you have synuclein. Uh, those misdiagnoses can be a really big problem. So those PSB patients are getting this $10,000 a year therapy that's doing them no good whatsoever. Uh, so you can imagine that healthcare payers or uh, whatever have you will be very interested in trying to really nail down the diagnosis to prevent unnecessary therapies for decades at a time. So some early st studies, uh, submandibular gland biopsies probably work. This generally takes a surgeon to do it, but if you can take a piece of tissue, even in the stages of REMC behavior disorder, eight out of nine of these patients had a positive biopsy. Um, nine patients had a positive biopsy. They attempted the biopsy in 21 patients. So submandibular gland biopsy is not easy to do, but what is really easy to do is a skin biopsy. This is one uh, very important study. This is not the original study. The original study was done by an Italian group. This is a German study showing you um, immunohistochemistry uh, of patients with Parkinson's disease, early stages of Parkinson's disease, blinded immunohistochemistry. 80% of Parkinson's patients are positive on biopsy, 0% of their controls. And 56% of idiopathic REMC behavior disorder have a positive biopsy. This will be published hopefully very soon. We've done this in Montreal as well. Again, a blinded immunohistochemistry approach, 70% of Parkinson's patients, 0% of controls, 82% of REM seat behavior disorder patients with a positive biopsy. And this I think would be a game changer uh, once synuclein-based therapies become available. All right, I don't know if this video projects. You never want to know whether on Zoom, but this is a patient with REM seat behavior disorder who's gonna start screaming and yelling. I might stop, actually stop this video if he's too loud. So this gentleman is having a dream that he's arguing with his wife. Uh, actually, no, he's, he's walking and he's arguing with some people who are threatening his wife. I should say that the right way. And he starts defending his wife from this attack. And you can see the paradoxical effect of that. He's more likely to injure his wife if they're sleeping together in the bed uh, from this movement. So this is a dramatic example of REM sleep behavior disorder. Now, REM sleep behavior disorder occurs in about 1% of the general population. This is not a rare condition at all, just that most people don't present to their doctors because of it. And it, the most common phenotype that shows up in a doctor's office anyway is men, about 80% men, 20% women, between the ages of 50 to 70. And some of that sex bias is actually related to just presentation. In fact, if you look at population-based studies, it's about 60-40, which is exactly the prevalence of Parkinson's uh, disease, the sex uh, difference in Parkinson's disease. REM sleep behavior disorder is strongly associated with neurodegenerative synucleinopathies and nothing else. So it's present in about 30% of Parkinson's disease, if you just ask them, and if you do a polysomnographic study, about 50% of Parkinson's patients have REM sleep behavior disorder. It is even higher in the other synucleinopathies. It's about, present in about 80% of multiple system atrophy and about 76% of those with dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, and these are clinical studies we did uh, in these conditions. You'll probably get it in nearly 100% of dementia with Lewy body studies. And it's rare in any other neurodegenerative condition. So 
And this is an important diagnostic aid. This is a pathological study that was done by Brad Bove. He, he looked at 172 patients in a multicenter study uh, who had REM seat behavior disorder. And so they had a neurodegenerative disease and they had REM seat behavior disorder. And if you took just those who had a polysomnographic confirmation of diagnosis, in other words, we're sure that they had it, 98% of those patients had synuclein in their brain. So if you think about the universe of all the neurodegenerative disorders that exist out there, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, the tauopathies, ALS, et cetera, only uh, 98, even though only about 20% or 15% of those are synucleinopathies, 98% of those, uh, uh, of those with RBD had synucleinopathy. And so it's essentially a diagnostic test by itself of neurodegenerative synuclein. And this is a, cr a crucial clinical point for those of you who do dementia. If you have a dementia patient in front of you and you have a convincing story of REM sleep behavior disorder, you are talking to a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, and this is enough now that a polysomnographic confirmed diagnosis of DLB is sufficient in the new diagnostic criteria to make a diagnosis of RBD by itself. I just want to mention something. It's a bit of a sideline, but it's, an, it's two things. It's a cautionary tale and an important clinical point at the same time. Um, we think of Parkinson's disease as being this unified thing, but it is not always a unified thing. I think it is mostly a unified thing, but there is a lot of heterogeneity of Parkinson's disease. And there have been a lot of studies now that have found that PD patients who have RBD do worse than those who do, do those who do not have this. And it is a marker of global prognosis. It is a strong marker of autonomic dysfunction. And it's a very strong predictor of dementia in particular. So those are single feature studies looking at REM sleep behavior disorder. This is confirmed uh, in, uh, in a study that look at uh, cluster analysis. And what we find is that it's a marker of what's called a diffuse malignant cluster of Parkinson's disease. Now this is actually defined, you can just do this. If a patient, um, clinically, if a patient has REM sleep behavior disorder, cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction, mild cognitive impairment, or if their motor examination is 50% worse than we normally see, okay? If you have three out of those four, the patient has diffuse malignant Parkinson's disease. In other words, you can define this disease mostly on the order, uh, on the basis of non-motor features. If they have this disease, they are at an 11-fold increased risk of ending up in a wheelchair, being demented or institutionalized, and a four-fold increased risk of death. And this is a confirmation of our original cluster study that came out of the JAMA, uh, that just came out in JAMA Neurology. So this is a, my personal prognosis prediction rule of Parkinson's disease is if you wanna know how a patient is gonna do, ignore their dopamine system. Look at outside the substantia nigra, look for autonomic dysfunction, particularly cardiovascular, look for any subtle cognitive impairment, particularly visual perceptual and attentional, uh, look for REM sleep behavior disorder, and look for falls, freezing, and the things that are non-dopaminergic. But I wanted to point that out mainly to, to because I'm going to tell you now all about uh, how REM sleep behavior disorder predicts Parkinson's disease, but be aware that there is a subset of people who don't have REM sleep behavior disorder and they have different uh, prodromal states. Okay, so off the sideline, back onto the, our main topic. Why is REM sleep behavior disorder so important as a predictor? And the reason is, is because it's by far the strongest prodromal marker that there is. This is the, I think now the definitive study that's come out because it's a study from 24 centers of 1,280 patients, uh, which are all members of the REM sleep behavior disorder study group, which is your group of, of, of centers who are interested in studying REM sleep behavior disorder. You can join it tomorrow if you'd like. Um, and what, we've, what this is, is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So what we're seeing here is that, er, this is a patient with idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder. And every time there's a little drop, another person has developed a neurodegenerative disease. And this observational study, which is mostly sort of observational cohort studies, suggested that about 7% of patients will develop on an annual basis will develop neurodegenerative disease. And it's kind of like primary uh, pure autonomic failure. They only get one thing. They only get neurodegenerative synuclinopathy so far. And uh, so it's half of them get Parkinsonism first, a bit more, about 60% get Parkinsonism first, and half of them get DLB first. You cannot tell the two apart. 
If you track this curve down, about 50% of patients at seven and a half years, 75% of patients at about 12 and a half years, and almost all patients ultimately will develop a neurodegenerative disease. And so the bottom line here is that if you have a polysomnographic proven REM sleep behavior disorder patient, I'll add the qualifier of say age over 50, you're talking to a prodromal Parkinson's patient almost every single time. There's almost no exceptions uh, to that rule. And so this is an order of magnitude stronger than what is seen in, uh, in, in uh, anything else. So uh, as a way of illustrating this, this is the uh, prodromal Parkinson's criteria. I'm not gonna spend time going over this, but this is essentially a summary, if you will, of everything that is proven to increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. And what we see here, these are likelihood ratios. This is a way of calculating probability. Think of it kind of like an odds ratio relative risk, although it's not mathematically quite the same. It's quite similar to an odds ratio, if you will. And so we see these are the risk factors for Parkinson's disease, all summed up in one slide. Okay, the bulletproof, definitely true risk factors for Parkinson's disease. So things like diabetes, which is a new one, increasing your risk of Parkinson's by 1.5, family history, increasing your risk, et cetera, pesticides by 1.5. And these are the prodromal markers of Parkinson's. I showed you a few of them. Here's global cognitive deficit of almost doubling your risk. Here is constipation, two and a half. Olfaction, pretty strong, 6.4. This is the pure autonomic failure that I showed you earlier, very, very strong at 18.5. This is a DAT scan, and this is REM sleep behavior disorder, 130, a whole new um, order of magnitude stronger than any predictor of, of Parkinson's known. And so this provides, in and of itself, of course, this is an important as a predictive marker, but it also provides a window of opportunity. And I want to tell you a little bit about research that we've been doing uh, on this. It's, there are three implications, I think, that are most important. First of all, it's a way to test predictors of Parkinson's disease. Second, it's a way to watch Parkinson's disease evolve from its prodromal stages. And third, it's a way to move towards neuroprotective therapy. So this is where we came in, where I came in. It's about 16 years ago, actually 18 years ago now, where we were doing a journal club when I was a fellow with Tony Lang. We were doing a journal club simply on a, a paper that was looking at treatment of REM sleep behavior disorder with pramipexol. That's all it was. But we had a discussion afterwards, and it shows how useful journal clubs is. And, and we kind of went, hold on a minute. Uh, Tony Lyon said to me, Ron, you're going to Montreal. And this paper was coming out of Montreal. And we thought, well, it looks like all these patients, maybe half of them or maybe a third of them, are going to develop Parkinson's disease. Here's a great opportunity. What we should do is we should look at these patients with REM sleep behavior disorder, and we should do a bunch of tests of other predictive markers and use them as a test lab. So we can follow the, we can do the test. We can follow them over time. We can see who develops Parkinson's disease, who does not develop Parkinson's disease, and then directly therefore prove that the marker predicts Parkinson's disease. And why would we do that? It's because of power. So imagine you wanted to watch 10, you wanted to get 20 new people, people developing Parkinson's disease, and you wanted to use the general population. If you wanted to do that in the general population, no problem. Do your test in 10,000 people, then follow them annually for five years, and you'll be able to get 20 new Parkinson's patients. If, however, you use REM sleep behavior disorder, you can get that same 20 with testing only 60. And so what you're getting is power. You can do a deep, comprehensive, and repeated analysis of predictive markers of Parkinson's disease and really get an idea of whether they predict Parkinson's disease, how well they predict Parkinson's disease, and let it, later I'm going to show you when they predict Parkinson's disease. So we started these studies 15 years ago. I'm not going to show any of the old studies. I'm only going to show the very, very new one. And this is the multi-center study, which really puts everything all together in one package. This is a paper that you can get off brain. I think it really is the best summary of this entire field because it combines everyone's work, not just mine. And there are many curves that I'm going to show you here, and they're all kind of the same. So what we're doing is we're taking that same Kaplan-Meier curve that I showed you earlier, and now what we're doing is we're just doing a diagnostic test at baseline. So this is a motor examination. So a slightly abnormal motor exam versus a completely normal motor exam. And now it tests into, at baseline, was that UPDRS normal or is that UPDRS abnormal? 
and you can see the difference in the curves. And this is the hazard ratio that comes from a Cox proportional hazards analysis that's basically adjusting for age, sex, and center. Kind of like a relative risk is a hazard ratio, if you will. Okay. And so what we see, no surprise to anyone, is that if your UPDRS is slightly abnormal, the threshold's only three here, um, you are at about threefold risk of developing Parkinson's disease. If you have some symptoms of, of motor decline, you're at about a twofold increased risk. And in fact, if you use the new UPDRS, it's much better. It's about a threefold increase. Here are some quantitative motor tests, ridiculously, ridiculously simple quantitative motor tests. How fast can you do this back and forth? How fast can you put pegs in a hole, the like? And what you see is about a three and a half fold increase. This is one of the most powerful uh, risk markers that we have. Interestingly, this is a DAT scan, and this is just a binary. People tell us, is your DAT scan normal or abnormal? Okay, so you can do better than this. Um, but this simple DAT scan, interestingly, is no better than a clinical motor exam or a quantitative motor test at identifying Parkinson's disease. There's a couple lessons in that. First of all, I guess that scan could be improved, and there are other, some other studies showing that a more specific quantitative approach can do better than just a binary uh, motor or non-motor flip. But what it really suggests is if this is what we can do with a, the most simple one minute test that we can come up with. Imagine what we could do if we stuck a smartphone in a person's pocket and had them wear an Apple watch and walked around for a, for a week or two. Uh, there's a lot of potential for subtle motor testing, testing of subtle motor signs, digital biomarkers and the like for identifying prodromal Parkinson's disease. Sorry, quick water break. So the other thing, remember that these patients don't just get Parkinson's disease first. They also get dementia with Lewy bodies and then they get Parkinson's disease in almost every single case. And so it should be no surprise that cognition predicts, Parkin predicts phenoconversion as well in this cohort. And on the MCI neuropsychological exam, a hazard ratio of about two possible MCI just on bedside exams, again, hazard ratio of two. And by definition, that predicts those who get DLB and not those who predict Parkinson's disease because they have to have normal cognition. So that's no surprise there. I showed you some uh, signs that autonomic dysfunction can be a predictor of Parkinson's disease. And in fact, we see this here in our RBD groups, and it's relatively low, just like we see in the general population. So constipation is associated with about a 1.7-fold increased risk, erectile dysfunction actually uh, even better, a two-fold increased risk. We didn't see clear predictive value of orthostatic hypertension or urinary dysfunction. I'm going to circle back to that because there's an interesting story there. Olfaction quite clearly associated. Now, there are floor effects in these studies because everybody is going to get Parkinson's disease. It's hard to get hazard ratios that are too high. Uh, so we, we see lower hazard ratios than we do in the general population. And if we remove those who get multiple system atrophy who have normal olfaction, uh, those hazard ratios climb to about what we see with a motor examination, about three. Also, I didn't show you this earlier, but uh, the ability to quantitate colors is affected in Parkinson's disease and can predict those who get it, but it really only predicts those who get dementia first. So it suggests that it's a cortical visual perceptive test rather than a test of the uh, retina, uh, which is also affected in Parkinson's disease. We did have a lot of, we actually did 21 markers of this. Uh, and so depression and anxiety were not predictive in our model, but there's a confound there because antidepressants can trigger RBD. So I would take that with a grain of salt. We didn't see predictive value of substantial Niagara ultrasound. We'll come back to that. And we didn't see a predictive value of sleep symptoms. If we combine measures together, uh, in other words, we use the MDS prodromal criteria of the 2015 version of that. Actually, that was the best. We got a hazard ratio of about 5.2, which is by far the highest, noting that most patients with REMC behavior disorder do meet the uh, prodromal criteria. The other striking thing, and this is philosophical as well, are these really two separate diseases. The most striking thing is how identical the prodromal states of DLB and Parkinsonism are. Uh, uh, PD and DLBR, I cannot tell them apart on any of the markers except for one, cognition. So the only way to tell whether a person is going to get dementia first or Parkinsonism first is to measure their cortex. Uh, and that tells you. And that will be interesting if you think about some of the models that I showed you earlier. 
This is an example where not everything works. <clears throat> so I looked at beat to beat variability. This is single center studies now. I looked at beat to beat variability. So the idea that our heart is not a metronome, it actually has a lot of fluctuations in its rhythm related to respiration and related to longer cycles as well. And this is just a quick quantification. I don't want to get into the weeds, but showing that um, REM sleep behavior disorder patients, their heart does beat like a metronome. They have lost all autonomic control of their heart. But when we follow them seven years later, those who have lost autonomic control or those who have not, if you will, there is absolutely no predictive value at all. There's also no predictive value of substantial Niagara Pars compactor ultrasound. And this was a bit of a mystery when we saw this for the first time. But then we thought a little bit further. When we went into these studies, we thought that about a third or a half of our RBD patients are gonna get Parkinson's disease. But it turns out that almost all of them do. And so, any marker that's really, really good and really, really early, such as autonomic dysfunction or maybe substantial Niagara ultrasound, it might already be gone by the time a patient shows up with REM sleep behavior disorder. So in other words, we lost our predictive value because it was that floor already. But on the other hand, if everyone's gonna get Parkinson's disease, this does give you a great opportunity to observe the stages of Parkinson's disease. So I explained this to you earlier when I showed you the Rotterdam study, but we had actually done this several years prior in Ramsey behavior disorder. And again, the ability, because we're following these patients every year and we don't know what's going to happen to them, we are systematically tracking them and we can track backwards in time. So again, this is a uh, REM sleep behavior disorder patient who is now phenoconverted to either DLB or Parkinson's disease. The DLB patients, by the way, all have the elevated eupiduresis as well. Most of them have Parkinsonism at the same time. And these are age-matched normal controls. And if we do the same back extrapolation, we can start tracking all of Parkinson's disease uh, in, this, in this group. And what we can see is that the UPDRS motor signs just like the Rotterdam study, start to deviate from normal about six years before. Motor symptoms, the patients are telling me that something is wrong probably earlier, about eight years before. And notice the shape of both of these curves. There's a bit of an exponential takeoff to these curves that we don't see for everything else. Clinicians always think that we can see Parkinson's disease in the face. We all walk around and we notice our colleagues who have this flat voice and non-expressive face. I've always got the gut sense that it starts there. Well, it probably does. This is the UPDRS split into uh, its various components. And what we can see is that the speech components, this is just me rating all of these patients, seem to deviate more clearly, if you will, four or five years, you still really see clear differences in speech, but you don't see those big clear differences in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in bradykinesia or postural changes or gait. You see those really much later in the disease. How about the motor symptoms? It looks, if we track each one of the individual motor symptoms, and I'll refer you to a brain paper that was just done. It's in June, 2017. Uh, the, the reference will pop up because there's a lot of details here. It looks like the motor symptoms, the first to develop are things like speech and salivation. So patients are telling us that they drool at night or they have a flat voice. And then they start telling us that their uh, gait is slow. I'm not seeing this on exam. They're telling me that their gait is slow, but I can't see it. Uh, they have difficulty turning in bed, so these sort of truncal things, and then the ADLs start to go. The freezing, the handwriting, the cutting food, those are a little bit later. How about the non-motor features? Well, the non-motor features are longer than the motor features. The prodrome is longer. So we're tracking back in time, and in this case, we're actually having to back extrapolate. Over here, I'm directly watching them deviate from you know, abnormal values. When it comes to the non-motor, there's actually some extrapolation. What's the first thing to go? Well, as early as we see these REM sleep behavior disorder patients, they have abnormal olfaction. It does progress slightly, but only slightly. If you backtrack that curve and try to catch where normal is, it predicts a prodromal interval of 23 years of olfactory loss. Next to go is autonomic dysfunction. And what we see is constipation, orthostatic hypotension, erectile dysfunction. Uh, where are they? Here they are, constipation. Looking erectile dysfunction as early as we can measure, constipation, urinary dysfunction, five, eight, 10 years before. Apathy seems to deviate early, but depression deviates a little bit less. And then finally, we start to see the cognition go in parallel to the motor signs. 
This is putting it all together in one curve. So this is the near maximum. This is the not the maximum score that you can have uh, on, a, on a diagnostic test, but this is sort of the maximum that we see in advanced Parkinson's disease on each of these scales. This is normal. This is when, this is that same line. This is when I'm making a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And this is each one of those things now plotted on the same graph. So for example, what you see is that hyposmia seems to deviate from normal about 20 years before. and does this curve so that it's basically 65% of its maximal score by the time you end up with Parkinson's disease. Here's REM atonia loss, which is tough to measure in this population coming in second. Here's the autonomic function, uh, dysfunction coming in uh, later. And then motor and cognitive signs coming in and not reaching maximum. Motor is, is a bit confounded because we have such successful treatments, but being about 30% of maximum scores about five years in and doing more of an exponential takeoff. So it's really the whole thing all in once in one figure. If you reflect on that, what we've seen here is almost exactly what is predicted in the pathological models. So those pathological models are back extrapolating autopsies and guessing on the, on the, uh, on the changes that happen, but we're seeing an almost perfect recapitulation of that. The BRAC to some extent, but even better, we're seeing almost a perfect recapitulation, for example, of this Mayo Clinic uh, model that I showed you earlier. The last thing I wanna do is talk about neuroprotective therapy. Just a couple minutes on this. As I mentioned, neuroprotective therapy is the reason that we're doing all of this. And it should be mentioned that there is, I cannot imagine a better group for a neuroprotective trial than idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder patient. Why? Because we're catching them early. We've got 10 years to intervene. They're almost all in prodromal states of neurodegeneration and very important for clinical trials. They're not on treatment yet. Uh, there's no dopaminergic therapy that's confounding our ability to measure the effect. And as those of you who are involved in clinical trials knows that these are absolutely fatal uh, to uh, testing neuroprotective therapy. So how could we do that? We've been spending a lot of time thinking about how one could run a neuroprotective trial, say of a synuclein based therapy using rem -seat behavior disorder patients. And so one of the critical questions that come up is what patient group do we have and what primary outcome should we choose? And so these are sample size calculations. Okay, let's imagine a very good agent. So it can slow the disease in half, okay? Uh, let's imagine a two-year trial, which is probably practically what one would have to do in these circumstances. We have two critical decisions to make. Which patient group should we pick, okay? And which primary outcome should we choose? So here's a patient group analysis. So if we, if we say now we're going to use the hardest endpoint that we can come up with, which is phenoconversion. So an RBD patient who phenoconverts to Parkinson's disease or dementia. If we just take everybody with a REMC behavior disorder, okay, we, we take our conversion rate of 6.25%. That translates into a sample size of about 370 patients per group in order to do this. This is the definitive phase three neuroprotective trial, 366 patients per group. If that's still too high for you, you can start to stratify. So for example, you can take those quantitative motor tests. Only 34% of our patients have a quantitative motor test that's abnormal, but your sample size is now 166. Or I think this is probably the best. You can use the prodromal criteria. 77% of your patients are still eligible for this trial, and your sample size is about 282 patients per group. So now let's take that. Let's just imagine we go forward with this, but let's think, do we need that? What's our best primary outcome? Could we come up with a better primary outcome? I think we can actually. So I'm taking this group and I'm putting it in my group now and in my study now, this is the international study. This has to be Montreal and we have to do the Montreal group because we've done all of these systematically over time. Let's, what's the best primary outcome. So in Montreal, we have a slightly higher feed and conversion rate, which I think is probably related to the fact that we systematically watch the patients convert each year. So we catch them a little bit earlier. We get about 240 patients per group. If we look at quantitative motor testing, your UPDRS3, there's no really obvious advantage. If we wanted to pick something like olfaction, it'd be totally useless because olfaction doesn't progress. But if we but what we were surprised to discover is that if we used a hard endpoint of a four-point worsening in UPDRS or 
a four point worsening in MOCA. So not just training effects, not just fluctuations uh, of the MOCA, but a real four point worsening. That's not good if you're worsening four points in a MOCA. We are starting to get able to get down into uh, under 200 patients per group for a, a definitive neuroprotective trial with 77% eligibility. So I showed you a study where 1,300 patients from the REMC behavior disorder uh, study group were available for a study. And now I'm telling you that we can do our neuroprotective definitive study using only about 400 of those patients. This means we can do a neuroprotective study in REMC behavior disorder right now. So with that, I'll stop just to go over what we all talked about here. Prodromal Parkinson's disease, major potential for the future. Many clinical predictors of Parkinson's disease with different diagnostic strengths, radically different from as low as 1.5 to as, as high as 130, different latencies, different costs and ease of testing. You can combine them together in the prodromal criteria. REMC behavior disorder is a special case because it's by far the strongest risk factor, factor that we have. It's a major opportunity to understand prodromal stages, it marks disease subtype, and it's a way of intervening. With that, I'll stop. I didn't leave too much time for questions, but a lot of material to cover. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ron. This was a fantastic overview of uh, prodromal Parkinson in general and the role of uh, Ramsey behavior disorders. Uh, such a beautiful uh, picture. <laughs> yeah, this is Montreal. It looks like around, the, right now it looks like this. Uh, this is my hospital oh. where, yeah, where I work. And actually this is the neuro where I also work. I now work mostly at the neuro. So this is, uh, this is where I go for walks when I run out of ideas. Yeah. Come visit sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the podium is open for questions. M maybe I will uh, give a quick uh, first one. Uh, uh, re realizing the role of Ramsey behavioral disorder as a predictor for future synucleopathy and following so many patients over the years, have you uh, picked up some um, behavioral modifications that have changed the risk over time? In other words, what can we do right now? Um, or what can we offer to the subject who are at risk? Yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't hang my hat on anything, unfortunately. There's not yeah. really much that we can do for this. The only thing that I'm starting to come around to, and I, I can recommend it because it's easy and safe, is exercise. So we're starting to get more and more uh, um, uh, suggestions that exercise is not just a symptomatic therapy, but it might even be neuroprotective. Uh, and even if it isn't, it's protective in many ways for all your general health. So I'm now telling all my patients to exercise and exercise hard enough so that you sweat, choose whatever you like. That's about the only thing that I would say I can stand behind. Uh, you know, people talk about caffeine, uh, things like this. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not so sure about those. I, I, I think we have to be careful in what we recommend to our patients. We have to back it up with something. So I think exercise is where we stand right now. I hope that's a different answer in 10 years. Um, could you comment on uh, GBA in association with RBD? Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, that's a connection that we have between Quebec and Israel. So both Israel and Quebec have a high prevalence of GBA mutations. We have some more founder mutations uh, as, as, uh, as does the Ashkenazi Jewish community. In our French, we, so we have our French Canadian founder mutations um, and we see a lot of GBA. And GBA is strongly associated with, you know, the subtype that I showed you of, uh, you know, of, of RBD, it's strongly associated with uh, GBA as well. We have, I think in our Montreal cohort, it's about 13% of our cohort has a causative, you know, a, a high risk of GBA or moderate risk of GBA mutation. And what's really striking is that they look identical to the rest of the RBD patients. So whereas the RBD patients look different than the rest of the, the the, the uh, uh, PD population, as does GBA patients on average, they look identical to each other. The only thing that we find is that the GBA uh, mutant carriers have an increased risk of phenoconversion. And it's almost triple, actually. Uh, so it looks to me that you can do a lot with that uh, information. So it's not really a marker of a specific type. It's a, in, in the sense in our RBD, but it's maybe an accelerant of the disease phenoconversion, uh, a GBA mutation. So uh, interesting stuff that we see with GBA. Uh, uh, I have another question about the uh, interplay between uh, different treatments, drugs, and uh, RBD that can um, uh, 
affect you know our impression or our results uh, you have published about the uh, antidepressive drugs uh, or other that might uh, change the, the the features yes that's right so yes uh, antidepressants are funny right because they can trigger REM sleep behavior disorder so the serotonergic system actually directly innervates the inhibitory motor neurons on the spinal cord uh, and so if you give a person the SSRI you motor activate them and maybe that's some of the reason for example that those stroke trials are showing positive effects of SSRIs um, so what that implies though then is that if a patient has an antidepressant and shows up with REM sleep behavior disorder why are they there uh, and so we've studied this a little bit, and it does look like those who are truly, you know, triggered by RBD, but the uh, RBD is still there after you stop the antidepressant. It's not a pure pharmacologic trigger. It looks like it, they have an underlying neurodegenerative synucleinopathy, and because of the antidepressant, it marked them as having neurodegenerative disease, okay? It, it, they showed up because of their antidepressant. You stop the antidepressant, all goes away, but you're catching them earlier. So they're at a lower risk of phenoconverting over time if you have an antidepressant, quite clearly a lower risk on average, but they have lots of signs of neurodegeneration that are still there, especially the long latency ones like olfaction and the like. The other modifier is that we've seen is a symptomatic treatment, if anything, makes it worse. Now, I think that might be an artifact, perhaps, of severity, uh, but interesting, clonazepam, those are treated with clonazepam, have a higher risk of developing dementia first, which I interpret personally as maybe a bit of, they're really getting both of these diseases, and if we're putting them on a sedative, they're going to present with you know cognitive treatments, uh, cognitive symptoms, perhaps uh, more early than those who don't. So I'm, I'm really trying to minimize doses of clonazepam when I start to see uh, 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 findings like that. And just perhaps, what can you uh, propose us for the real severe cases of RBD uh, as a treatment, as a symptomatic treatment? Right. So, you know, uh, clonazepam probably works. Melatonin may or may not work. There's actually a negative randomized control trial on melatonin, so I don't know what to think about that anymore. Um, yeah. Usually it doesn't. Prazos yeah, prazosin can uh, maybe uh, reduce the intensity of dreams, but orthostatic hypertension can be a big problem in this group who is prone. I'm quite Tra convinced. Say again, sorry. Trazodone, you said? Prazosin, prazosin, alpha ah. agonist. The PTSD docs use it a lot uh, for the RBD associated with PTSD. Uh, and then I'm pretty convinced, I've seen it many times, that dopaminergic therapy can in some cases reduce REM sleep behavior disorder symptoms. It doesn't appear to do anything directly to the Remitonia system, but I've definitely seen it uh, enough times that I think it's a real effect. Um, often though, what I end up doing is I don't chase it too hard. Uh, I tell my patients, you want to cure your REM sleep behavior disorder, and I put cure in quotation marks, uh, sleep on a mattress on the floor alone with no sharp objects. Uh, rather than, you know, and I'm, the, the rhetorical point I'm making to the patient is that the only real problem with your RBD is it might wake you up once in a while, but you might get injured. And it, it may be acceptance of it and finding a way to mitigate the risk rather than putting a patient on high doses of clonazepam and melatonin and prazosin, et cetera, may in fact be a better option for these severe cases. Um, there is a positive the... signal, signal with cannabinoids in one study, but uh... yeah, there is. Yeah, and I yeah, and again, I really wish we could study that, but we just can't. I mean, there's just in Canada, we it's legal, and so paradoxically, it makes it almost impossible to study because getting approval to study a natural health product that has an unknown, uh, it, the bureaucracy <laughs> of this stuff is, un, is unbelievable. Uh, and so, essentially, we can't do research in cannabis, but I was sure would love to because I wouldn't be surprised if it does something. Any other question from, uh, maybe you can stop sharing around so we'll see people who are- uh, Ah, yes, let, let me do that, to... yeah. Stop sharing, yeah, I see the 71 people here. You can also use the, uh, I'm seeing things in the chat. I can read the chat as well. There are special bed alarms recorded by the partner for uh, uh, RBD treatment. Danielle Wasserman mentioned this. Yes, uh, there's a, someone has invented a bed alarm that records the, the spouse's voice every time they get out of bed. 
So as soon as they notice, you know, that they've uh, fallen out of bed or actually, no, it's, it's not getting out of bed. It's a recorder. If, it's, if it starts to hear too much noise in the room, then the, these, the spouse records a voice saying, you know, Harold, you're just dreaming, go back to sleep. Uh, and uh, this apparently has been useful in some cases. I, I think it's a neat idea. Uh, it's, it's also potentially very good for sleepwalking. Uh, because sleepwalk, RBD patients don't sleepwalk as part of their RBD. Of course, they can also be sleepwalkers, uh, but it, it, you can use these pressure sensitive pads. So as soon as the feet touch the ground, uh, there's a recorded voice that says, go back to bed. Uh, you're, you're having a dream or something like this. So yeah, this is an interesting way of, of treating this. Okay, I think we are over the hour. It was a great talk and really you've highlighted the, the importance of the prodromal phase and hopefully it will serve us as a, the best group to modify the risk or uh, prevent Parkinson in the future. This is the role of our center to help pre preventing Parkinson in the future. So uh, you really have set up the stage. Thank you, Ron, for uh, taking the time and being with us. Thank Ron, you. Oh, thank you. Ron and Nir, if you can just stay online for a few minutes. Good night to all. Okay. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Bye, thank you. We'll see you in a month, if not before. So how is the corona in uh, Montreal? Or? Yeah, fairly high. Yeah, we're the we're the epicenter of Canada. Actually, uh, we got seeded from New York uh, and we got seeded from Europe. Uh, we had the bad luck of having our spring break a week earlier than everyone else. So we're the only ones who had a spring break. And uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, in our initial seed was mostly New York and our second seed was Europe and yeah so we're the epicenter it's it's okay though uh, we're all right um, we kind of have I think Israel has higher rates uh, has quite high rates hey uh, we, we used to have very high rate but now uh, it has really dropped dramatically over the past three weeks okay Oh, you, you guys had a good lockdown, I guess, and the yeah, holidays yeah. passed, so... We were the first to go back to lockdown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they work. And our government's been quite responsive, actually. They, they lock down, not as aggressively as Israel, but they, they're, they usually lock down and open up. And so we have a lot of fluctuations, and which is hard for people to take. But anyway, I'm glad it's going down. Yeah, it really, you know, I was supposed to come in April. It would have been great, actually. I've never been to Israel. We, we, once we, all this craziness will be over, you will have you over here. No, oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Be sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I just had to remove everyone and, and not to- Oh, that's, that's the easy way. It's okay, I'm happy to chat. I need for our donors, um, just a picture of your first slide in you. And somehow I missed that in the beginning. So okay. <laughs> we have to do this for our, uh, you know, sure. our donors to the Alcyon family, a really amazing family from New York. And they okay. get $5 million for the center and hopefully they oh they'll give us another five. So we give them reports every three months and we try to be really thorough. And I try to remember to do this, <laughs> but this time I forgot. So we'll just, uh, you know, kind of pretend that you're starting. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so that, that, that this would be Like good. so, okay. Nice also that the three of us also, um, let me get rid of this chat here. From this. Uh, so we had a nice turnout today, I have to tell you for a kind of a lazy Thursday afternoon. Oh, it's good, yeah. Oh, it was an excellent talk and uh, it was remarkable. Look, the thing is about advising research, uh, exercise, you're not hurting anyone because we should all be exercising, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. The problem is uh, doing that. By the way, I was born in Granby, Quebec. So oh, really? I, I, oh. A few years ago. So I left when I was four, but my family lived in Cote St. Luke and we used to go to Canada all the time. And uh, the only thing, the thing that I truly miss from there is coffee crisps. Oh, right. <laughs>
Yeah, I'll try to remember that. If I ever come, I'll try to remember to bring some. I'm sure I'll forget. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's get you here. It's uh, it would be really wonderful to have you. But that was really remarkable talk, and the turnout was fantastic. So we really appreciate your waking up so early in order to do this. Um, a little better, I think, today because of the hour. Next week it would have been even earlier for you. Yeah, that's right. If only I would have known that. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. It's good to get up early. It's good for the, okay. for the Well, you guys can continue talking if you want. I'm going to continue with what I need to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, really, and, really uh, I understand, Ron, that, that uh, you're enjoying uh, uh, Fadi. He's a great clinician. Yeah. He's, he's a good person, too. Like he, a very he's, char charming person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we we're really happy. You know, uh, we've had a couple of fellows recently who we sort of have to do a lot of heavy lifting. And I, I already within within a month, I said, I don't need to see your letters. Just send them straight to the secretary. Things like this, you know, uh, he's, he's good. Yeah. Super. Yeah, that, that's nice. Yeah, he, he will, I'm trying to get him on research projects. That, that's sort of starting a little slower, but uh, that's... He has little, if any, experience with that. So the, this is an area that uh, hopefully yeah. we'll pick up some at, at your place and then we'll bring it back. Up yeah, we so he's, he's coming from the northern part of Israel uh, for um, as an Arab uh, Israeli. And it's important that we will bring good people over there. Right. Yeah. No, he'll do well. Uh, yeah. He'll do well, I think. No, it's been a pleasure having him. And as it turned out, he's our only fellow right now because of all this cancellations and stuff. So we have three coming in, you know, later, but he's all by himself right now. So he's kind of appreciated. Great. Thank you for having him. It's just... Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Okay, so really uh, uh, wonderful. And then we'll make you come here. The sooner the better. Hopefully uh, it'll be a, a year or so and we will start traveling again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it'll happen. We just need a vaccine. I'm sure it'll happen. Okay. Okay. Thanks Take again. care. Really? Take care.